Thank you, and good morning. This paper is in response to one of the questions asked in the initial call for submissions to this Kwahi conference. It was a simple question, but it was, which stories are still to be told? The simple answer to that is, many. And this is one of those stories still to be told. Um, late in the evening of October 14th, 1891, Lord and Lady Aberdeen took possession of the 480-acre property in British Columbia's Mission Valley, now the Central Okanagan, which they had purchased sight unseen the year before. They arrived at Gusakan, named after the Invernessshire estate belonging to Lady Aberdeen's family, the Marchbanks, after a moonlight trip down, a uh, four-hour boat trip down Lake Okanagan from Vernon. As Lady Aberdeen noted, they were pleasantly surprised to find themselves, quote, in the midst of hills looking more like Gusakin Hills than any others that we have seen in Canada, end of quote. Years later, their daughter Marjorie, who had accompanied them, recalled that her parents, quote, hurried like gleeful children, along with myself, aged 10, to see their very own playhouse, Gusakin, B.C. While it seems likely that Marjorie, drawing on memories from nearly 60 years earlier, conflated her 1891 visit to Gusakin with the Aberdeen's Christmas gift of a holiday house to their children, complete with garden, uh, at Christmas time two years, two months later, the idea that the new Gusakin was a playhouse for the Aberdeens is intriguing, especially when set in dialogue with the several dozen photographs which Lady Aberdeen took with her two Kodak cameras during the course of their visit. These photographs were sorted and labeled and then placed in various family albums for the consumption of future generations of both the Hamilton Gordons, the Aberdeen family name, and the Marchbanks. In 1893, 21 of these Kodaks, plus one watercolor, were included in the two chapters devoted to the Gusakin farm in Through Canada with a Kodak. The published and public account of the Aberdeen's 1890 and 91 cross-Canada trips. Within the book, Hereafter Through Canada, the role of these Kodaks was primarily to provide visual anchors for Lady Aberdeen's enthusiastic narrative. Until now, the photographs, as discrete entities in their own right, have received little scholarly attention. In this paper, I argue that a close reading of the Gusakin snapshots reveals information about the Aberdeen's first colonizing venture in the Okanagan Valley that is not disclosed in the two chapters on Gusakin in Through Canada. As opposed to the diaristic account aimed at the general public, the photographs, many of them not included in Through Canada, contain a personal, private narrative about family relationships which was not intended for public consumption. My discussion singles out those photographs that frame Gusakin Farm as a site where carefully chosen snippets of Marchbank's family dynamics could be re-envisioned and inscribed on the newly acquired land. As photographic historian Val Williams has pointed out, quote, photography gave Victorian women the opportunity both to identify a personal history of their own families and to place those families precisely within, within a certain schema. A family once photographed assumes a particular reality fixed in time by its portrayer. Following Rosalind Krauss's expansion of Pierre Bourdieu's commentary on family photography, and paraphrasing a bit to suit, I contend that in Lady Aberdeen's hands, the camera was a projective tool, part of the theater that she constructed to convince herself that the family was together and whole. One of the central concerns of the Aberdeen's Gusakin agenda was the rescripting of the biography to date of the eldest of Lady Aberdeen's two younger remittance men's, men brothers, Coots Marchbanks, in such a way that the problems that had dogged him while managing his father's ranch in North Dakota were recast as matters of location rather than the result of any personal failings of the man himself. While the nature of Coots's misfortunes in North Dakota are vague, Lady Aberdeen, a committed defender of her brother, blamed his neighbors, not pleasant people to associate with, she said. The Gusakin Playhouse, carrying the name of Lady Aberdeen's family's Highland home, and not that 
of her husband, would provide the ideal site for rehabilitating Coots, whose relationship with both his parents had become strained over concerns about the American ranch. And although Lady Aberdeen offered various overlapping rationales for the purchase of the Goosican farm in her journal, uh, including Lord Aberdeen's desire to own a shanty somewhere in Canada, the primary motivation appears to have been the need to establish Coots within reach of both Empire and the Presbyterian Church. It was a new start for Coots, and as of late 1890, he was in position as manager of the Goosican farm, despite Dudley Coots Marshbanks, uh, his father's disapproving patriarchal gaze upon the Okanagan property, which he felt neither Coots nor the Aberdeens had the business acumen to manage, to manage. My discussion looks at two themes within the photographs. Firstly, the group of Kodaks, which focuses on the farm itself, underscoring Coots's centrality to the enterprise. And secondly, those that show him within the heart of the family, participating in various family activities with his sister, niece, and brother-in-law. In order to convince future generations of the success of his re-entry, Lady Aberdeen is frequently photographed with the family group, the task of documenting the event for posterity falling to someone else. The new house at Goosican, BC, the first step in the re-establishments of Coote's Marchbanks, received Lady Aberdeen's warm approval. By the time the Aberdeens arrived in 1891, the construction of Coots's house, which was to serve as the Aberdeens' home away from home, was complete. One of Coots's first tasks had been to design a new house to replace the smaller one, which he rejected as inadequate. This new house, possibly based on one of the prefabricated bungalow-style shooting lodges then being sold in Britain, uh, would signify new ownership and management and the imposition of social order on land, which until recently had been owned by the McDougalls, a mixed race family who had preempted the land in 1860. The house was described by W.D. Hobson, a recent English immigrant, as very large for this country and quite luxurious compared to the shack and hotel life in Vernon. In her journal, Lady Aberdeen described the skill with which her brother had decorated it, noticing especially the, quote, sort of gold Japanese go uh, paper, end quote, and she approvingly recorded the number of bedrooms, the office, the kitchen, the large sitting room, and dining room. The veranda running right around the house pleased her, and she enthused that it is just perfect and everything is delightful. Lady Aberdeen took many photos of the exterior of the house and also attempted a photo of the entrance hall. Um, unfortunately, the photo is so dark that one can't see the, quote, horns and heads of deer shot by my brother in Dakota, end quote. What her photos don't show, and something she may not at this point have been aware of, was that the house had no insulation and only a thin layer of the gold Japanese paper covering chicken netting over the frame, rendering the seven fireplaces impotent in the face of the Okanagan winters. While it is easy in retrospect to see this as a first sign of Coots' incompetence, it wasn't <laughs> apparent in the balmy autumn of 1891. A comparison between a watercolor sketch and a photograph, both done by Lady Aberdeen, likely at the same time and certainly in the same location, offers a useful look at the disjuncture between what she saw as a painter and what she saw as a photographer. The watercolor, um, this is not the one included in Through Canada, is simply labeled Goosican, BC, October 1891. In it, the farm is subordinated to Lady Aberdeen's aesthetic colonizing gaze. She focuses on the house, seen slightly to the left of center and raised on a platform above the flat land, and then to the far right is the house that Coots rejected. However, most of her attention is on the hills in the background, which reminded her so much of the hills around the Scottish Goosican. There is little in this view to to tie this view to the Okanagan, except the title, and if one is familiar with it, the topography. Even the house is a transplant from one colony to another. The watercolor of Goosican fits easily into the picturesque Esperanto of its day. It is essentially a 
painting of a country estate done in keeping with what Malcolm Andrews has referred to as the picturesque's homogenizing habit that dulls with sameness and familiarity. This broad sweeps of paint throughout the foreground occlude, occlude the fact that this is land in transition, one of the early salvos in a whole-scale agricultural transformation of the Okanagan. Rather unusually for the Okanagan at this time, <clears throat> in this case, painter, photographer, and developer are one and the same person. The almost identical Kodak uh, of this scene looks more raw, less inviting. Here the foreground is bumpy and irregular, possibly the result of the recent hay mowing or plowing. The hills in the background are barely visible, and it is the house which commands attention. While the watercolor creates an image of Gusakin as a place of possibility in a welcoming geography, the photo, grittier and more subdued, gets at something different. The magnitude of the task that the Aberdeens expected Coots to take on, that is to transform this land into a successful orchard that would bring fellow settler capitalists, was enormous. Neither the Aberdeens nor Coots knew much about the economic realities of large-scale intensive fruit farming with its attendant issues of irrigation, transportation, and distribution, although few others in the semi-arid valley did either at this point. The capital-intensive development of orchards didn't arrive in the Okanagan until the early 20th century. Lady Aberdeen's warm support for her brother's management skills extended to her approval of his choice of men to work the farm. In Through Canada, she wrote, we were fortunate in securing a very nice set of men, and I'm sorry that our code act does not do them more justice, end quote. Despite this, she included a photo from her album of employers and employed Goosekin, BC, but in Through Canada, labeled it instead the Goosekin staff. The international workforce which Coots has assembled stands and sits on the porch at the back of the house, subject to her gaze. Lord Aberdeen is sitting while Coots is standing on the far right. I read this photo and its original label referring to employers in the plural um, as once again reflecting Lady Aberdeen's support for her brother by legitimizing his role in the management of Goosekin. But there is something else in this photograph. To our eyes, Gusekin was clearly a homosocial milieu, as were so many frontier communities in Canada and elsewhere. And it was probably more like Dakota, North Dakota, than Lady Aberdeen had expected. As historian Adele Perry has pointed out, quote, drink was the most significant traditionally all-male pursuit, and that backwoods men were ardent drinkers was a standard part of social commentary, end quote. Lady Aberdeen was pleased with the team Coots had assembled, but as she confided to her journal, the presence of Le Kim's tavern nearby was worrying. She noted that young men in the area were going to the pub after church every Sunday and drinking away not only the week's wages, but occasionally their title to their farms as well. Although she doesn't say so explicitly, there were few signs of empire in the Mission Valley in 1891, other than Gusekin House. Uh, the nascent community of Benvolen, which included the farm, was mostly male, and there was as yet no Presbyterian church. Services were held in the schoolhouse with an itinerant minister coming down from Vernon, and the congregation counted three women. So it was, it was very much a frontier. A photograph entitled, Coming Home from Church, shows Coots perched atop the family buggy in the company of his sister and brother-in-law. It records Coote's participation in the family religious rituals, but of course offers no proof that this was more than a token gesture. As the do uh, devout Lady Aberdeen wrote in Through Canada, quote, if settlers are allowed to get into the habit of not attending church, many opportunities for promoting religious influences and for preventing evil will have been lost, end quote. She noted approvingly that Coots and Eustache Smith, the foreman he had brought with him from North Dakota, were going to try to organize local Sunday prayers. But then she wrote, curiously enough, Coots seemed to assent more heartily to the proposal than Mr. Eustache Smith. It seems that one of her aims, that of bringing Coots closer to the influence of the local Presbyterians, was working, at least in her eyes, but the proximity to the local watering hole remained problematic. 
There are a number of photographs that position Coots firmly within the heart of the family. He is seen in conversation with his niece on a boat, riding across the farm, both alone and in the company of Lord Aberdeen, Marjorie, and sometimes both of them, and heading out to hunt bear with Lord Aberdeen. Knowing that her father would demand a full accounting of Coote's activities, Lady Aberdeen noted in her journal that neither Coote's nor Eustache Smith had been to a bear hunt before because they have been so busy watching the house and its builders. Not watching carefully enough, though. Um, but two sets of photographs are particularly germane to my argument that Gusakin was a site where carefully chosen snippets of Marchbank's family dynamics could be re-envisioned and uh, inscribed on the newly acquired land. The first is a series of photos that show the Aberdeens with Marjorie and Coots planting fir trees that they've brought from Gusakin, Scotland. For the, um, uh, for the London-born Lady Aberdeen, a passionate follower of the cult of the Highlands, the fact that her name, Shebel, and Gusakin, meaning place of the firs, were Gallic, held deep significance. Several photos are devoted to the Ur imperialist gesture of planting the small fir trees, and in some of them, some of, uh, someone else has taken the camera so that Lady Aberdeen can be seen to be fully a part of this heavily symbolic activity. Coots, in the one I'm showing you, is present in many of the photos, watching the planting with mild interest. However, he is not shown down on hands and knees doing the actual planting. The final set of photos under consideration shows the family gathered on the veranda of the house after a hunt. Using the carved woodwork as a pictorial frame, Lady Aberdeen, positioned both behind and in front of the lens, and sorry, no stranger to photographic studios, works within well-established conventions of hunting party photographs. In the one that I find most interesting, she carefully positions her family in a triangle within the cube of space, revealing through careful hierarchical structuring the dynamics of family power at Gusakin. Reading from the lower part of the photo, we see Marjorie sitting on the steps, reinforcing her position as the child. But it is Coots's glance towards Lord Aberdeen that is particularly interesting. Coots has turned away to put his gun against the wall of the house, but he looks back across his left shoulder at Lord Aberdeen, who is casually leaning against the porch's post. It is impossible to see either Aberdeen's or Marjorie's eyes, but Coots, caught in the moment, looks at his brother-in-law. He's not friendly, nor is he hostile, but he is wary and appraising. The focus is on the two brothers-in-law whose lives by now were deeply entwined, but it is a relationship of unequal power. Coots, 31 years old, has traded the patriarchal control of his father, Lord Tweedmouth, for that of Lord Aberdeen. In her book, Family Frames, Marianne Hirsch has written of, quote, the space of contradiction between the myth of the ideal family and the lived reality of family life. It is precisely this contradiction which underscores Lady Aberdeen's photographs of the family at Gusakin. I have argued that Lady Aberdeen sought to reintegrate her brother into the family after his troubled years in Dakota, using her camera as a tool to convince herself and others of the su success of this private family project. Some of the photos, those that show the family's recreational activities, support this. However, the reality of Gusakin was in some ways quite different from what Lady Aberdeen had imagined when first presented with a salesman's sharp promotional pitch. As a close reading of the photographic record suggests, the Aberdeens made a number of blithe assumptions about Coots's ability to translate cattle ranching into orcharding. That these assumptions would soon become problematic is apparent in the photographs of Um, sorry, it's, um, I've lost a photograph. I think we'll just um, put right. it back there. Uh, the that's one. fine. That's good. No. Photographs both of the roughly cultivated land at Gusakin and of the team that Coots had brought together. The men are dressed as cowboys. Their background is ranching, not orcharding. There are many ideas and threads which one can follow in the reading of these photographs. But in concluding, I will emphasize three. 
The first is that the Aberdeens were only at Gusakin for a short time, and therefore any notion that the photographic uh, the photographs could represent family unity is as illusory as the impression of solidity created by the gold wallpaper covering chicken wire in the house. The second is that despite Lady Aberdeen's desire to bring her brother Coots within the security of empire and church, the Mission Valley and therefore Gusakin were distant from the Imperial Centre in 1891. They were the colonial fringe and there was little support for Coots once the Aberdeens left. And finally, Marjorie's metaphor of the playhouse, introduced at the beginning of this paper, is useful for considering the photographs. Not only was Gusakin a place where siblings, Lady Aberdeen and Coots, could explore and reenact family rituals in an idealized setting, but for eight days in October 1891, it became a playhouse in the sense of a theater set for a family performance choreographed by Lady Aberdeen, where each member of the cast performed for the camera's gaze and the family album. Thank you.